start yes good evening to all of you so i welcome you all for this webinar on open injuries actually the open injuries are like a major challenge to any orthopedic surgeon and to get an, an overview on these open injuries and also to enlighten all of you for with these open injuries we are the team with dr ashikran as head of the department myself taking care of the trauma service and dr ramesh who is also with us and he takes care of pelvis and acetabulum as a specialty and then devendra is more into geriatrics and also into uh, oncology so with this background and all the team members have got a major experience in open injuries purely because we manage nearly 1500 open injuries every year and almost like a grade 3b injuries we have an average of 600 cases per year so that means nearly two cases per day we keep getting and then every team member is extremely experienced here, and then they will be enlightening on all the questions that you have and then we have scheduled the topic in such a way that initially we will talk about a open injury as an emergency situation and then how this must be managed up to the operation theater and then from then we will have to talk about how do we manage it on day one and after that once the debridement is over then we will have to score the patient and we have published our ganga hospital score that we will also be enlightening on it and finally we will give you some clinical case discussions with this uh, short introduction i call upon dr ramesh perumal so ramesh perumal is basically does all the trauma with a special interest in pelvis acetabulum i request him to come over and then give a lecture on like all the fractures that happen and then open injuries moment they come into casualty how it is to be managed and from then on up to the theater so i request ramesh to come in please thank you uh, dr ramesh please unmute your mic sir am i audible yes, yes sir thank you very much sir um and the first topic uh, in the open injury webinar is immediate management of uh, open injuries from arrival to operation theater as you all know open fractures are uh, often very high energy injuries so at most of the time it happens in the road type road side injuries so a scoop and run approach where you the ambulance or the vehicle which is going to take the patient has to go and take the way, take the patient and run to a nearby uh, trauma center is the safest approach in all these injuries as you all know the golden hour in the management becomes a platinum of 10 minutes when there is an associated polytrauma with open fracture the most important aspect is the nearby trauma care center where the multidisciplinary care is there is the appropriate place for these patients to get treated the so who predicted in 2001 itself in future the bodily injuries are predicted to overcome the infectious disease worldwide in terms of productive life cost we all see in the recent update by the who organization in the top 10 causes of death road injuries are in the eighth number they predicted that it might go up in the future so when an injury presents is like this to the emergency department there are patient factors like an age obesity and the functional demand and the presence of bone quality and the comorbid conditions of the patients like diabetes mellitus ischemic heart disease or kidney disease and smoking and also the injury factors so the severity of the injury associated polytrauma with other injuries so these are all collectively going to give an outcome of these major open fractures so these are all the concerns when the patient arrives to an emergency department so the evolution of open injury management has gone through four eras in the era of life preservation in 16th century ambrose power described about the cleaning of the wounds and removing the necrotic material 
but in those times the amputation has become the life saving in these injuries it has been moved on to era of limb preservation where in 18th century desol coined the word of debridement and the principles of resuscitation and skeletal stabilization and soft tissue recovery has been uh, evolved in limb preservation the next era is the infection prevention where the term of aggressive debridement and introduction of antibiotics made a breakthrough in the management of open fractures <coughs> and also the evolution of classification has been formed uh, by gasillo and anderson in the current era of functional restoration along with the aggressive debridement there is an early soft tissue recover along with the early definitive skeletal stabilization has been uh, has been uh, practiced and also there has been molecular level of understanding has been uh, described in the recent times in the form of uh, the evaluation of the injury at biochemical levels the markers which can raise over over this uh, major injuries like in uh, serum lactate interleukin 6 so we will be covering the topic in the immediate management where when the patient comes to the emergency department we evaluate them both as the the vital parameters and also the blood investigations so the pathophysiology is it is the incidence of open injuries is 11.5 per 1 lakh persons per year it is more common in developing countries as the road traffic accidents are explosive and the diaphyseal fractures are the commonest presentations in a ganga hospital in, a, in an year we experience uh, for around 1500 patients so most of the open fractures commonly in seen in the diaphyseal page diaphyseal fractures and also 50% of our open fractures are in the the distal femur and the proximal tibia and the tibial shaft fractures these are every year we we see around 1500 patients in our trauma audit department so when a patient comes to the emergency department apart from the atrial protocol airway and breathing or one of the concern the hemodynamic instability in a suspected pelvic injury when it comes we have to give a, either a circumpressor sheet or a pelvic binder and also you have to assess the severity of the injury in the affected limb and most important thing is monitoring the vitals so the initial assess, assessment always uh, follow the atrial protocol where you look for the airway breathing circulation and other things is the disability and exposure treatment of open injury starts at the emergency room itself so there be an active uh, involvement of the team members where you can reduce the morbidity and the mortality in a hemodynamic instability our first aim is to give a resuscitation it has been evolved over a period of time from massive resuscitation to damage control resuscitation when you take a massive the amount of crystallized were given more than 2 uh, to 3 liters and the resuscitation room itself this has caused the dilutional uh, coagulopathy so hence it is more evolved over a period of time with the damage control resuscitation the first principle in this uh, open injury management we are going to see 10 principles the principle number 1 is the damage control resuscitation it aims at giving an systolic blood pressure of 80 to 90 mm of mercury where it maintains the end organ perfusion and also maintains a mean arterial blood pressure when you give a more amount of fluids the systolic bp might go up it might cause a pop the clot phenomena it might cause further bleeding in this internal organ injuries or in the open open fractures and the other thing is using a hemostatic resuscitation it gives a blood products so that the the over infusion of uh, crystallize can might cause a dilution coagulopathy hence giving a hemostatic resuscitation we can address the dilution coagulopathy also so the next thing is comes to the damage control orthopedics in uh, open injuries which gives a skeletal stabilization as you all understand the surgeon performs the damage control surgery is considered as a part of a resuscitation the anesthetists are going to give a stable hemodynamic instability but the surgeon is going to give a damage control surgery in the form of a surgical resuscitation so the optimal fluid of resuscitation has been debated over a period of long decades it has evolved over a period of time from hypotonic saline to isotonic saline and the ringer lactate can also be used in this open fracture resuscitations the crystallites in the initial time has been reduced to 2 liters to 1 liters from the modified atls protocol and the blood products has been given in the ratio of 1 is to 1 is to 1 in the form of packed red blood cells fresh frozen plasma and platelets and also you can give the whole blood but massive transfusion of whole blood itself will cause hypothermia acidosis hence you have to be careful in giving in whole blood and tranexamic acid is useful in the first 3 hours of injury in a case of severe hemorrhagic shock the principle number 2 once the anesthetist is taking care of uh, the resuscitation part 
principle number two is we have to do the documentation of the open injuries. History about the incident is very important. Where it happened in the fall from a height from a construction place, or it happens in the road traffic accident, or it happens in the farm yard injuries. And these are all injuries are very important for documentation. And the treatment given at pre hospital place, any fluid was given by the paramedics or the compression bandage, or it has very important about the history at the pre hospital place. And also the history sustained to accompanying passengers. It is very, very important. See, when a car accident happens, the four or five accompanying patients might have a uh, might have a mortality or some other major injury. It gives an indirect evidence the person is going to have more and more injuries. And the comorbid factors also decide in the management of these injuries. Like as I already mentioned, like a diabetes mellitus, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, or patient who are on uh, blood thinning drug. These are all very important in the initial management. And the number three principle number three is examination. Examination of the wounds. It has to be a proper exposure of the whole body to look for the injuries apart from the open fractures which 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 has been um, seen in the obvious in the limbs. Because many many of our, many of the times uh, we, we fall for the obvious like a major crush injury on the right leg. He might be having an uh, pelvic injury or he might be having a blunt injury abdomen or some amount of hemothorax. These are all the uh, injuries which is not obvious so we are we have to look for the other injuries we should not uh, focus on the major visible injuries also the grossly deformed and uh, shortened limbs needs an immediate splinting where it might cause an uh, expanding hematoma or a vascular injury and the tinting of the skin by sharp bony fragments has to be addressed because a proper uh, splinting in the initial times might cause the necrosis of the might prevent the necrosis of the skin and the next part is the neurological assessment and the presence of compartment syndrome and the vascularity assessment. It is very, very important in open injuries. They are more prone to have a uh, compartment syndrome and the insult to the vascularity system. The severity of the wound, many times it doesn't matter. There may be a small puncture wound, but the X-ray might show a disastrous uh, bony injury. So we have to document the injury in the casualty in the emergency room itself. As a photographic documentation, we always, whenever an open injury comes, we do the open injury documentation from the casualty itself, and we have to give a sterile dressing of the sterile dressing to seal the wound. So it's very very important to prevent the infection, as most of the infections are hospital acquired. So we have to give a clean saline dressing, and it has to be covered with a plastic sheet, because many times the wound gets soaked in it, it might soil into the bed. So we usually in the casualty, we give a sterile saline dressing followed by we give a plastic sheet to cover the wound. In a case of an arterial injury, we might give a compression dressing or in case of a hemodynamic instability with the documented severe bleeding, you can apply a tunique in the emergency room itself. But it is very important to give a handover about the time when the tunique was inflated and it has to be recorded in the emergency room. It has to be conveyed to the people who are in the operation theater also. The so blind clamping should never be attempted in the emergency room. This is the one of the very early photographs taken a long time back. A blind clamping was done. It uh, causes the injury to the neighboring uh, neural structures and also the vein and the other things where it might crush the artery also, where it might require an entry and anastomosis might require a, a vein graft to address the vascular injury. The signs of a vascular injury, there may be hard signs or not. A soft sense, hard sense is an absence or a significant difference between the normal limb or there may be a documented severe hemorrhage from the wound or there is an expanding hematoma in the affected limb. These are the hard signs of vascular injury. Associated signs are there may be a presence of neurological deficit and also the altered temperature when compared to the normal state and there is a delayed or no capillary refilling and absence of pulse oximeter. These are all the signs that may be an associated vascular injuries. So compression dressing in the emergency room and splinting the fracture might reduce the deformity. Then you can reevaluate the vascularity in the emergency room itself. Splinting the fracture, if the pulse is not palpable, we can do a handheld Doppler, which we have in our emergency department. We do a handheld Doppler uh, sickness. If the signal is not palpable, it can be directly taken to OT for exploration. In delayed presenting cases, we can uh, order for a CT angiogram to look for the the type of block, the level of block, and also the status of collaterals can be addressed. 
So neurological examination, the motor power examination is very difficult because of injured muscles. The, it is difficult to evaluate the motor power, but touch and pinprick testing is possible in an autonomous zone of the particular peripheral nerve. It is also a part of a compartment syndrome examination. The principle number four. So the open wounds, the role of cultures in the emergency room. As you all know, the infection is the major threat in these open fractures, but there have been enough uh, literature avail available about the poor correlation between the positive cultures and the clinical infections. There have been disparity of bugs between the, uh, the, the uh, bugs uh, that have been isolated from the initial cultures and also the late infection, there has been dis disparity between the bugs. However, the infection, the hospital bugs are the commonest source of infection. Hence, we don't routinely practice the cultures in our emergency room. Principle number five is use of antibiotics. It has been considered as a therapeutic in these open injuries and not a prophylactic. It has to be administered as early as possible in the emergency room itself. Once the patient's renal profile is uh, stable after the blood test, the antibiotics can be given in the emergency room itself. It depends upon the institutional experience. When there is an organic or sewage contamination, we can add metronidazole and we give uh, tetanus toxoid in all and also the TED globe in form yard injuries. So our Ganga hospital guidelines is either we give a kefiroxim 1.5 mil 8th hourly until the first debridement and after the, during the soft tissue closure, we give a cephalosporin along with the gentamicin continue until the soft tissue cover for at least two to three days time. We had metronidazole in form yard injuries. The patients who have got anaphylaxis to clexin, we used to give clindamycin 600 mg IV 6th hourly. The recent practice and guidelines have been published in 2009. There have been over a period of a decade from 2007 to 17, there are 223 eligible publications have been analyzed and they advise that early systemic prophylaxis is been much useful and the duration is varied apart from the institute experience from two to three days time. So now principle number seven is the trauma series of excess. Once the patient's hemodynamic stability is achieved, and the neural and vascularity assessment is done and the wounds have been properly sealed and antibiotics has been given. So the patient is going for the next trauma series of x-rays. The affected joint above and below including the whole limb has to be taken with the proper AP and lateral view is a must. And in this case of an, uh, major injuries, you have to take the one joint above and below. Here you can see an open supracondylar fracture femur. The pelvis x-ray shows the hip joint is dislocated. So it is very important to include the joint above and below. And also in the affected open injuries, you have to look for a gas shadows and the presence of metal foreign bodies. The gas shadows indicate a uh, amount of anaerobic organism and also the presence of metal foreign bodies needs an aggressive debridement and removal of all necrotic and foreign bodies. So in these cases, you should not order for a repeat x-rays. You should avoid multiple shift in these patients so you have to give a proper examination on all the x-rays has to be taken in a single room. You should not repeat the x-rays. So other pelvis and chest injuries as a part of a trauma, so you have to look for uh, uh, pubic diastasis and SI joint injuries or a pelvic astabular injury. And chest injury should look for an, uh, life threatening injuries like a hemothorax or a hemoneumothorax. In cervical spine lateral, we have to look for uh, upper cervical spine injuries. So in a patient who got a open distal femur or articular fractures with the hemodynamic instability. If the patient is stable, you can take in the CT scan to look for the articular comminution and the congruity. Where in the immediate, in the, the next talk, if the patient is stable enough, you can do a definitive fixation on day one in a form of a debridement, articular reconstruction and a plate or nail fixation, uh, whatever is amenable at that point of time. So when the patient is hemodynamically stable, you can do a CT scan in a polytrauma patients. It has been described by tunnel of death in an unstable injury where patient might lose the life in the CT tunnel when the patient is hemodynamically unstable. So there has been an argument about whole body CT versus selective regional CT. Because in a selective regional CT, there are 31% of missed injuries have been reported. When a patient underwent a CT abdomen, you might have an upper cervical spine injury or some amount of intracerebral bleed which is missed in the initial time where patient might uh, need another additional CT scan. And also secondary survey is very important because of 23 to 30% patient will have uh, another missed injuries in some other uh, 
part of the body like a foot injuries or some hand injuries so as this definite reduces the mortality as a definite source can be identified in most of the cases in the initial whole body ct itself the principal number 9 is apart from the uh, open fracture you have to look for the associated injuries like an uh, head uh, intracerebral bleed in a cranium or there is a multiple uh, rib fracture rib fractures in the thorax or there is a bowel injury or there is a laceration in the groin it might be a presentation of an open pelvic injury because all these associated injuries are direct dependent factors for the mortality and morbidity when there is an associated open fracture so here is a case of an open distal femur with a pelvic injury is a part of a polytrauma he had an uh, type 3b comminuted open distal femur fracture and there is a major uh, open pelvic injury while the patient was hemodynamically unstable your damage control resuscitation was done when the patient was hemodynamic stability is achieved we did a whole body ct that identified a bowel injury and a large presacral hematoma and a depressed frontal bone fracture where patient underwent a damage control uh, orthopedics in the form of uh, debridement and external fixator application for the distal femur and also the pelvis was done for the wounds were debrided and the laparotomy was done for the bowel injury a defunctioning colostomy and a peritoneal packing was done as a part of a damage control surgery the, the last one is the role of uh, biochemical markers as you all see the trauma invokes the humeral and cellular cascade mechanisms So it can cause uh, multi-organ dysfunction syndrome and mortality in patients who have got a polytrauma with the deranged uh, mechanisms. The biochemical markers quantify the systemic inflammatory response syndrome as they all then lead on to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. The currently available biochemical markers are uh, serum lactate, interleukins, and C-reactive proteins. So serum lactate, the normal level is between 0.5 to 2.2. It becomes significant when it is more than 2.5 millimoles per liter. It is a high level indicate the cellular hypoxia with hypoperfusion, and there is an anaerobic metabolism is going to take place. As there is a delay in the normalization of lactate, has got a direct dependent factor for uh, mortality. And this persistent elevation indicates. the amount of resuscitation indicates high chances it may develop in multi organ dysfunction syndrome and mortality for the disadvantage it requires serial estimation in our hospital we used to do on arrival 6 hours 12 hours 24 hours look for the look for the pattern of serum lactate level if it progressively goes up there is a chances for a multi organ dysfunction syndrome if the resuscitation is good patient is responding well the markers will come down in over a period of 12 to 24 hours the other concern is interleukin 6 the normal level is uh, less than 7 picogram per ml but however the significant level is 200 picogram per ml the high initial level of interleukin 6 indicates there is a uh, presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome it indicates the high level indicates where you have to stage the patient in a form of a damage control surgery once the levels have uh, come down less than 200 you can plan for a stage reconstruction so in the initial part of time it gives an assessment where the patient will develop a systemic inflammatory response syndrome or it needs a damage control surgery will be depicted by interleukin 6 uh, levels as you all know it's a, it's an inflammatory pro inflammatory mug it, it shows a bimodal presentation initially it is it will be high in the, in the later part of time again it will come down and there is another peak it will be seen in the second to third week of time it may not be useful for the exact uh, limb injuries but the role is in uh, polytrauma has been well defined but open injuries we are doing our own experience and it is not available in uh, many centers it is little expensive and it, it also requires a serial estimation so i think a c reactive protein the normal is uh, less than uh, 3 microgram per ml if it is more than 30 it becomes uh, significant it is easily available and uh, less expensive but the thing is traced both in inflammatory and also in infectious condition so you cannot differentiate between inflammatory and infectious con- infectious conditions So in our hospital, we did a bio- biochemical marker-based outcome. We used the uh, serum lactate and interleukin six, and uh, in a group where patient have got an uh, normal baseline biochemical markers in a stay forty nine patients, we did a single stage reconstruction and we analyzed the incidence of deep infection, flap failure, and second day amputation. And patient who have got an elevated uh, biochemical mark under the stage fixation, we have analyzed the Uh, incidence of infection flap failure and amputation when we compared our previous study without a biochemical markers you can see 
uh, there is a significant uh, a difference between the incidence of infection flap failure and second amputation so the biochemical marker based uh, treatment is going to be the future and we are evaluating our uh, results and uh, we are planning to add into our score and to conclude in the immediate management from arrival to operation theater earlier transfer to nearby trauma center to multidisciplinary care is a paramount importance in managing these injuries and once this patient comes to the emergency department atls based evaluation is very important and the documentation of the wound and splinting of the fracture and sterile dressing is to be done in the emergency department a neurovascular examination and trauma series access has to be done and early administration of antibodies in the emergency room is also is very important before the patient goes to outpatient or the operation theater thank you very much for your patient listening Thank you, Ramesh. So now, Professor Rajeshwaran will uh, speak uh, on Ganga Hospital score. So, uh, give your introductory remark, and then also. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, uh, Didi. Uh, at the outset, I would like to welcome all of you for the space seminars, which have been a largely a very successful event. One of the primary events was. Um, that we need to focus on post graduates because um, covid has really closed down many of the educational opportunities where there was a face to face meeting and uh, we thought that education should not be closed down so i really thank the organizers for doing this most of these have been um, attended by many hundreds of post graduates who have found it very useful and i hope that this is also uh, falling to the same standards now trauma is uh, one of the biggest problems for not only developing countries but even for the developed world and if you look at india which is one of the most populous areas you will find that major injuries like this are a common place almost every day you would see an average orthopedic surgeon in britain looks at a 3b injury only less than 2 per year but here an average orthopedic surgeon would at least see these about 35 to 40 every year and in a big center like ours we get more than 700 major open injuries every year so it is important that you need to have very clear concepts on how to treat them because even one small mistake can burn a bridge and then the patient can end up with a very poor result now many centuries before hippocrates said that the physician should avoid the treatment of such injuries if he has a reasonable excuse to do so for the risks are so great and success so small now nothing much has changed over the years the principle requires the same In India we get about 20 open injuries every 6 minutes where there is a one death on the Indian roads every 3 minutes. And in these injuries we have made a lot of progress. Initially our whole <coughs> uh, efforts were to save the lives and then it went on to the era of limb salvage, then it went on to the era of infection control. And now we have progressed to the era where at the end of the treatment you should not only have a limb that is salvaged but you should also have a limb that is looking very good in form because cosmos is very important to the patient and also function is very important to the patient now let me show a good example this is a very severe injury you can see that there is a huge soft tissue loss and a bone loss but if you do all the proper steps correctly over a period of time you will find that this patient comes back to a good restoration of his normal life but looking at the literature it is not always a bed of roses like that now there is a primary amputation rate of up to 12% in injuries like this complications coming and forcing a secondary amputation in another 18% and the limb could have been salvaged but is not acceptable to the patient either in form or in function so if you look at it when you see an injury like this 
you should already know that this patient is at risk for a very poor result almost in 30% or one third of the patients. So there are three types of outcomes possible. And the first is that you do a debridement and you do all your attempts at reconstruction and you do a successful salvage and that's an excellent result. The second one is that you do a debridement and at the end of the debridement, you think it is non-salvageable and you do a primary amputation and then rehabilitate him with the good processes. That is also an acceptable result. What is not acceptable is that you make an error of judgment after your debridement and you do multiple attempts at reconstruction. Patient undergoes a lot of complications and the secondary amputation and that is not acceptable because between the injury and the secondary amputation, he would have undergone many, many, many different types of surgeries with a lot of pain and a loss of uh, finance for him and also his whole family. And that is not what we should end up with. If you look at what are the causes of failure, you will find that this happens at two periods of time in the line of management. One is an error on the question of is this limb salvageable or not. Trying to salvage a limb which should have been amputated is one major problem. Second is making a decision which is of inappropriate timing and an inappropriate choice of limb salvage pathways is another one. And these are all more frequent in Gustillo 3B rather than 3C. We always think 3C is where there will be more complications. But whenever there is a 3C injury, everybody knows the outcome and they are very careful. But it is in 3B that is a huge number of complications because according to the classification of Gustillo, all of these injuries from the top one on your left to the bottom one on your right, all of them are by definition grade 3B injuries. Now you can see that they all comprise of varying degrees of severity of injuries from the easily manageable to the bad, sol badly salvageable. Now, that means you have the good, the bad, the ugly, and the rotten, all put into one definite classification. And that is a problem in Gustillo's classification. There are also many definitions in circulation from the time of its original definition. And there is a poor intra and inter observer agreement. And these two publications, which are often quoted, have shown that there is only an average agreement of only 60% between different observers. And there are some injuries which are very inherently difficult to classify, leading to a wide variation of acceptance. The third problem is with the definition itself. Now, there is a difference in definition between the Atlantic on the North American side and in the European side. Now, in Europe, the Gustillo 3B classification is defined by the characteristics of the wound. But in North America, it is defined as an injury that will require a flap. Now, if you look at this injury, when you see it in the beginning, everybody would agree that it is a 3B injury. But if it is treated by a primary closure, then it gets degraded, downgraded to a 3A injury at the end of the treatment. So the definition becomes slightly retrospective by what is the type of management that you do. And that's another major problem with Gustillo's classification. So it is not just our opinion, but there is adequate uh, mention in literature that Gustillo's system is not an adequate basis for treatment decisions or for comparison of published results. Now, what about the numerous other scores that are in circulation, starting from the MESS to the Limb Salvage Index or the Hanover Fracture Scale? Now, if you look at it critically, all these scores are designed to assess ischemic limbs with combined orthopedic and vascular injuries. So these scores give a high weightage for vascular injury. And whenever there is no vascular injury, the limb, however seriously it is crushed or injured, is underweighted so that you tend to downgrade the score 
and you may end up with secondary amputation because your salvage attempts have failed. So this is one of the important publications which have said that there is a poor sensitivity and specificity for prediction of amputation and the predictive capacity was poorer in 3B than 3C injuries for all the previous mentioned scores. And we know for every one of 3C injury that we see, we at least get 10 3B injuries. And unfortunately, till the Ganga score came, there was no specific score to evaluate severely injured limbs without vascular injuries. And also there was no score that went beyond salvage and tried to provide guidelines for reconstruction. Now, why do I mention the reconstruction and how is it important? For example, we know there are wide variations in the patterns of uh, open injuries. Now, this is one extreme. You can find that this patient has got an extensive injury to the covering tissues. He has got a complete degloving of the whole lower limb. But the only bony injury that he had was a dis slightly displaced fracture of the petala. Now, this is completely different from this injury where you can see that the soft tissue injury is very low but the injury to the bone is quite severe and can be quite challenging to treat and can pose problems. The third is, of course, these injuries where you have all the tissues, the covering tissues, the functional tissues of muscles and nerves and tendons, and also the structural tissue of bone and joints. All of these are affected. So in every single injury, there are many different varieties. And that is why we at Gago Hospital felt that there is an important need to provide or investigate a score where it will be useful for answering the patient's perspective. Now, all the patients who came to us had also another problem of wanting to know the prognosis. How many days would the patient would want to stay? How many number of surgeries would be uh, necessary? What is the approximate cost of treatment for these patients? And for all these, we required a score that would give us the answer. And this was exactly what we proposed in 2004 in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery as a score for predicting salvage and outcomes in gustulo uh, 3A and 3B injuries. The principle of this score is uh, simple. Uh, the, each open injury has got an injury to the skin and covering tissues. It has got an injury to the bone, an injury to the functional tissues of uh, muscles and tendons. And also there is comorbidities which affect the outcome. Now we know that any of these injuries when it happens in a young college student is completely different from a 70 year old man who has got many comorbidities and who might have had a myocardial infarction three months earlier. So comorbidities must be given a high value and importance in your decision making. And that was one of the critical reasons. Rather, on apart from assessing the injury to each of these tissues of the limb separately, we also gave a very good weightage for the comorbidities. Now, each of these, the covering tissues, the functional tissues and bone, they had an incremental score from 1 to 5. Now, injuries which are 1 to 2 needed no special skills. 3 required special skills, but good results were still possible. And four and five were severe injuries, which demanded special skills. You could do a lot of, but still, there was a high chance for complications and which compromised the result. Now, let us look at this. Now, you can see that there is a skin injury of various injuries. The primary problem was one and two were injuries where there was no actual tissue loss at the time of injury or during debridement. So, they were primarily closable. That's the most important thing. In one and two, irrespective of the size of the wound, it may be small or it may be big. But if there was no loss of skin and it could be easily opposable, and if it could be primarily closed, it was one. If it was not over the exposing the bone, and it was two, if it exposed the bone. Three and four, irrespective of the size of the wound, where Injuries which had actually loss of the skin and hence could not be closed. Now it was three if it was not exposing the bone and if it was four if it was exposing the bone. 
5 was a circumferential skin wound. Now you will know that your management is going to be really depending upon this. So wounds without a skin loss can easily be closed primarily. When there is a skin loss, when not over the fracture can be closed by uh, simple plastic surgical procedures. When over the fracture, sometimes it requires a muzzle or a free flap. And circumferential wound with skin loss is a major challenge that requires multiple procedures. The same philosophy was in the bony injury. You can see from the simple transverse fracture to a large community fragment, butterfly fragment or major comminution involving the joint was graded from 1, 2 and 3. 4 was a bone loss less than 4 centimeters and 5 was a bone loss greater than 4 centimeters. Now why 4 and 5 are differentiated like this? Because there is ample uh, evidence in literature that when you had a bone loss less than 4 centimeters, sometimes you could be very well treated by bone grafting. But when it exceeds 4 centimeters, you either needed a bone transport or a free fibular transfer. So you can see it actually steps up and up according to the score of the management. Muscles, tendons and nerves were the most difficult to, <coughs> to classify. So you had a partial injury to a musculotendinous unit, it was 1. If you had a complete but repairable injury, it was 2. So 1 and 2 did not give rise to any functional loss. Whereas if there is an irreparable injury to muscle tendon units or a partial loss of a compartment and complete injury to posterior tibial nerve, it was 3. Which means that these limbs were salvageable, these limbs are repairable, but there may be some small element of function. But if you have a loss of one entire compartment of musculotendinous units or a loss of more than one compartment or a subtotal amputation, it was actually fine. So here is a pictorial evidence of from score 1 to score 5. And you need to actually be careful when you do this uh, scoring for the musculotendinous units. Now, other comorbid factors which actually influence the outcome, like an open injury presenting later than 12 hours, heavy contamination, an elderly age more than 65 years, debilitating diseases, fat embolism, coagulopathy, associated systemic injuries, and another injury to the same limb. All of these uh, involve this, and you know, it can, you added two points to each of this uh, condition. So you arrived at a total score by calculating the score that you got for the skin, for the bone, for the functional tissues, and also the comorbid. And this score was formulated in 1997 and then underwent two trials and then was published in 2004. Now in the primary publication, we had considered 99 3B tibial fractures. And here you can see according to the total score, all 89 tibial fractures, open tibial fractures, grade 3, below 14 were saved. And none of the five with the score of above 17 were saved. But in between the two scores, 15 and 16, there was some injuries which could be saved. And that is the reason we brought out the philosophy that in an amorphous situation like an open injury where there is so much of variability, you cannot have one score where you will say that this is a very rigid uh, law written in stone where above that you will amputate, below this you will say. It is not possible to do that. And that is actually the unique feature of the Ganga Hospital score, which gives a gray zone in between, where these are salvageable according to many different factors. So looking at the sensitivity and specificity, we chose 14 because its sensitivity and specificity for uh, salvage was very high. So we said above 14, below 14, you should attempt to salvage. Above 17, you must think of uh, Think a lot before you attempt to salvage. And then in between, you should be having a good uh, discussion and thought process before you do your planning. So looking at this, you can see that Ganga Hospital score had a huge advantage over even MESS in its specificity. Because the problem of MESS is, again, like all the other scores, it gives a very high weightage to avascularity and ischemia. Now, even in a very massively damaged limb, if the vascularity was slightly intact, 
then the mess will always tend to underweightage and you may be tempted you may fall into the trap of thinking that this should be salvaged but here you can see the mess actually gives a score of salvageability and ganga hospital score gives a score of uh, be cautious before you salvage and that is the value of uh, ganga hospital score so this is the recommendation below 14 you must salvage 17 above may require amputation so think a lot before you attempt to salvage 15 and 16 are gray zones and that exactly depends on many factors it depends upon the surgeon's factor suppose you have a very highly skilled microvascular team then 16 can be attempted to salvage if you do not have the basic recovery or surgical skill team then you know you should err on the side of amputation it depends upon the fact patient factors and the skill of the team also so the gray zone you can see over here for example this is a 23 year old male has got a massive injury of the lower limb but you can see in his upper limb he has got a extensive injury and also has got an avulsion of the brachial plexus so with a failed limb it is impossible for somebody to be independent to put on a prosthesis and other things and then we went on an extended salvage and that is the reason you can find that this patient uh, you can see that uh, he was salvaged you can see that he has got a flail upper limb on the right side but his lower limb was salvaged but this is completely different from this scenario same score of 15 but here the patient factor is completely different you can see that this patient is a 71 year old male with a road traffic accident but he has had a myocardial infarction Three months before, in this patient, multiple surgeries and a prolonged surgery for uh, flap is too risky for his life, and then it is important that he undergoes a primary amputation and he has a restoration. The Gamma Hospital score also goes much further than just deciding on amputation or salvage. It also can help you to decide by. where and by whom should each of these injuries must be treated we have always found that limb injuries with a score of more than 10 must be referred to uh, specialized units for example this was a college student run over by a lorry you can see that he has got a very bad injury but in addition he also had a open injury of the pelvis he had a chest injury but you know this patient was successfully salvaged and you can find that even over here you can have he has got a very good uh, function over here so that is the importance over here so all these major injuries when they come over to a specialized unit a higher amount of salvage and a restoration of a higher level of function is possible so when you have a ganga hospital score of more than 10 it is important that they reach and are treated by units which are Uh, capable or specialized in this treatment the third major advantage is it also gives you an indication of how to treat and the choice of limb salvage pathway now you will find in the next talk dr devendra might be telling about what are the steps and what you will do on day 1 throughout the world this is the accepted principle when an injury like this comes you resuscitate and uh, do all the things that are required by the principles of atls then you debride then you do a skeletal stabilization and usually this is kept for day 1 soft tissue cover and definitive bony procedures are kept on another day now the whole question is in some of these injuries at least is it possible for us to do a total reconstruction on day 1 itself and that is very important to know because you have to be careful that you should not burn a bridge or you should not do something wrong where the patient then gets into a series of complications and gets into an uh, amputation now this was our publication where we have found that these patients exactly where you fix and flap or fix weight and reconstruct now all these are actually the first three can be done on day 1 but when do you decide who can undergo a complete reconstruction and who has to wait and for that we found in our experience and this is also published that there are two determinants one is the skin score which shows the suitability of closure and the other is the total score which shows the extent of violence now let me show this 
If you have a skin score of less than 2, which means that the patient does not have an actual skin loss, these patients can be treated by primary skin closure. Now, this is a treatment uh, patho uh, principle. You can see that there is a total score is only 4. Skin is 2 because there is no primary loss. And this patient was treated by a primary closure and a primary fixation. And you can see that she has got an excellent result. Yeah, good debridement is very important. And I'm sure that they will emphasize to you later also. Another example, compared to the previous wound, this wound is much larger. In fact, three to four times larger. But please note that this skin injury also has got the same score because the Ganga Hospital score, skin score does not depend upon the size of the wound. Rather, it depends upon whether there is a skin loss or not. Again, you can see here, even though this is a 15 centimeter wound, it, has, it was primarily possible to close because there was no primary loss of the uh, skin. Whereas even a smaller skin wound, if there is a patchy loss of the skin, it will get a higher score. That is the speciality of Ganga Hospital uh, score and you should always uh, note that. Now primary closure needs experience in assessment and debridement because every wound when it comes to the casualty will always appear as if there is a big loss. That is because there is overlapping of the two bones or there will be a deformity of the bone because of the fracture. And that will open up every skin wound and it will always appear very big. But when you debride, you can extend these wounds also for good debridement. But when you debride and you are able to bring this to proper uh, length of the limb, you will find that the skin is opposable. It's almost like you cannot close a lady's handbag when it is like that. You need to pull it to length and then you can easily zip it up. So this is a good example. It looks like a large wound. But when you bring the bone to proper alignment, you will find that it is primarily uh, closable. One of the things that you will have to know, and this I would like to emphasize a lot. What is the source of infection in an open injury? Now, we all think that these wounds are infected at the site of the injury. They can be. They can be uh, contaminated. But most of the times, the permanent infection takes place only in the hospital. It's because of hospital infection. Look at all the organisms in your hospital which have infected open wounds. It will always be MRSA. It will be Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, pneumoc uh, I mean uh, Pseudomonas or Klebsiella. Now, these organisms which are resistant to antibiotics are never found on the road. They are all hospital organisms. And the more you leave a wound exposed, you have a very high chance for hospital contamination. And that is the need that you need to provide a closure or a cover. I am not saying that every wound has to be closed. It cannot be. But if it is not closable, then the onus is on us that we should at least provide a cover much early so that the secondary hospital contaminations like this are avoided. Now we all owe it to Pats, uh, Patsakis who actually first showed that most infections after open fractures are caused by pathogens acquired in the hospital rather than the accident site. So that is the very important lesson that when an open injury comes to uh, casualty, right from the casualty, because casualty is a very infected place. Everybody has to be very careful that you are properly gloved before you handle and once the wound has been inspected and photographed, you must close the wound. And during the ward also, you must be very, very careful. I'm sure Dr. Devendra will talk about it. Now, we did a study where there was, uh, this is the world's largest uh, published study of primary closure of uh, open injuries. And we gave a very important criteria. This is published in the American Journal of, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. And you can take this as uh, the strict criteria for which you can provide this. In our large study of 173 uh, patients, the total patient was more than 546, of which 173 patients were closable, which means one-third of 3B injuries alone you can close. Two-thirds you cannot close. And we found in these patients the deep infection and the superficial infections were much less.
This is just to show even big wounds can be closed because when in doubt, this is the most ticked up. If you are in doubt after a good debridement, if you're not very sure of your debridement, if you have to bring your skin in too much of tension, or if you are doubtful for any particular reason, high diabetic, heavy contamination, then please don't close the wound. So this is the publication in uh, 2009. People who are interested in it can look at it. The third thing is, when do you do uh, 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 soft tissue reconstruction? And here, the total score comes into health. All injuries which are below the score of 9, which means that they are low energy uh, injuries, and so these injuries can be closed primarily. You can see that the skin is 4, which means that it needs a flap. But the total score is less than 7. So you can do a flap very early. <clears throat> Even if it is not done on day 1, it can be done before 72 hours and you can have a very good success rate. So here you find that between delayed primary reconstruction, immediate reconstruction and staged reconstruction, the Ganga Hospital score provides an excellent guideline. So total score 9 of below, you do it primarily and there should be no individual score 4 or above and the comorbid scores must be less than 4. So a good example, two differences. Two big injuries, one the score is less than 9, 7. You can see the swelling is less, the energy of violence is less and this could be treated by a yearly flap. 13 means the energy of violence is more. The zone of violence cannot be clearly uh, identified. These patients must be treated by uh, wait and watch. So you can see uh, a score less than 8 has been very early flap has been done. But when you have a high score, you just have to go through the many steps. You have to debride, you have to leave the wound open, you do an external fixator, wait for some time, do a free flap, and then you do a bony reconstruction. And that is very, very important. A good example is here, 14, which is almost a threshold for amputation. But you can see that we have externally fixed, then the bone transport, then a free flap. And because of this, staged policy, you can see that his limb has been salvaged and he has also got an excellent uh, function uh, which is to him. So in summary, Gastrilo's classification was a very important milestone in uh, open injuries because they, for the first time, proved to the orthopedic surgeons that a soft tissue injury that accompanies a fracture is more important in determining the outcome of the open injury. But it has numerous problems and then, but now we have gone one step. And I think that Ganga Hospital score has gone many steps um, where it helps you to decide on salvage and also it decides on how many people, uh, how you can uh, treat them. And this is very important to our country because there is so many road traffic accidents and industrial accidents. And for all these people, the Ganga Hospital Open Injury Score is very useful. The individual score will provide guidelines and treatment, and the total score will help to decide, salvage, and also prognosticate uh, outcome. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity, and I will hand this over back to uh, Dr. Dina Dayalan and for the other speakers to follow. Thank you. Sir, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So you made it very clear to us and then I think everybody would have understood because of the examples you gave and also the way you took it along to tell us about the various aspects of Ganga Hospital score. So we'll continue with the Dr. Devendra's presentation. Sir, now where, how far to go on day one immediately after the injury? And then we will take it to next. Uh, and then, sir, we will also be having a discussion at the end. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dini. Dr. Devendra will. Uh, Dr. Devendra is uh, one of our co consultant who is specializing in actually in all the open injuries. And he has got a lot of interest and then he has got great interest in publications in open injuries. So I request Dr. Devendra to come over, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Good evening to all of you. I am going to discuss about the principles of debridement and how far to go on day one regarding skeletal stabilization. If you look at the, any open injury, when a, the open injury happens, when a moving object comes and hits the limb and the kinetic energy that gets absorbed from the moving object, it gets dissipated throughout the whole limb. The, uh, apart from bone, the uh, surrounding tissues also, they absorb the energy and the, uh, the tear in the skin causes open fracture and the momentary uh, negative suction effect happens which sucks the foreign material which is lying in the surrounding of the leg and it gets sucked to the in, inside the medullary canal and to the opposite side of the tissues as well. So it is important that when we see these kind of injuries on day one in casualty, we should not reduce them immediately. Uh, we need to debride this, uh, this open injuries properly and then only we need to reduce to, uh, otherwise the infection chances are quite high. Debridement means it is not just wound washing, it is an active surgical procedure which involves uh, removal of all the dead or avascular tissue and foreign material lying in the uh, open injury site and we need to leave only the viable vascular tissue without any contaminants. The term debridement was coined by Desalt in the 18th century and this is how it has been uh, uh, debrided from the previous wound. The, uh, completely one layer has been removed. Uh, all the contaminants from the uh, bone and tissues has been completely removed and uh, this is an active surgical procedure. Now the question comes when to do the debridement and there was uh, the traditional teaching is to complete the debridement within six hours. However, the most of the open injuries, they may not be able to present within six hours. And this rule of six, hour, six hours has been studied uh, very well in the literature and challenged by many authors. And now currently, current evidence says that the six hour rule is no longer valid for open injuries. And more importantly, the efficacy of debridement in removing the devitalized tissue from the open injury site is the most important factor which determines the outcome. Now uh, let us see how to do the debridement of the open injury. The first essential is, uh, essentially uh, important thing is to have a tourniquet uh, before we drape the limb. Uh, tourniquet helps us uh, in many ways. We can debride the contaminants in the intermuscular planes easily and it reduces the blood loss which is so important in such severely injured patients where there is uh, additional blood loss and it helps us in assessing the viability better and after debridement we can deflate the tourniquet and assess the completeness or thoroughness of the debridement and if we found it an inadequate we can reinflate it and continue the debridement. So tourniquet is the first essential uh, uh, thing to start the debridement. The other uh, important requirements are we need to have a uh, mesh trolley with provided uh, bucket underneath to wash the limb uh, before we drape the leg and a mesh trolley with outlet during debridement which is useful uh, to wash it and then drain out all the fluid while washing the leg. The other uh, important requirement is we need to have a good amount of uh, autoclave water. There is a lot of debate in the literature uh, about uh, what kind of solution to use to wash the open injuries. Uh, whether to add soap solution or antiseptic solutions, betadine or chlorhexidine. And uh, now the current evidence is that the normal saline water is sufficient and we use in our hospital uh, autoclave water and uh, the full uh, complete use of saline water is, uh, a lot of water is important like copious amounts of water to take away the whole debris from the uh, deeper aspect of the open injury and also the uh, high pressure lavas we don't use in our institution because it has got a disadvantage that it can push all the debris and dirt deeper into the compartments and also it can damage the living tissues like periosteum, tendons and neurovascular structures. We use low pressure, uh, low pressure uh, bulbs uh, to wash the open injury wounds. Uh, coming to the superficial debridement, which includes debridement of skin and fascia, indiscriminate removal of skin flaps must be avoided. Any open injury wound we see, we need to extend proximally and distally, and then uh, skin edges needs to be removed by a millimeter so that fresh edges are seen. 
uh, with the bleeding edges and whenever we see a large skin flaps like this then we should not completely excise them which requires a large free flap covers and uh, in fact the distally uh, based flaps have uh, poor vascularity compared to proximally uh, based flaps and any flap with a large uh, thick tissue has got a better uh, viability and may survive if we close it uh, primarily so better not to excise the skin flaps the thick flaps which has got a soft tissue attachment nicely and important apart from skin the fascia needs to be debrided quite uh, radically since leaving the fascia uh, devicelessed fascia inside the uh, open wound can cause commonly infections and whenever we see this kind of two wounds uh, two adjacent wounds with a intermediate small skin and most of the times because of the degloved skin underneath the, the skin may not survive and it is better that we debride on day one properly by excising the skin uh, by communicating both the wounds and then complete excision of the uh, skin which helps us to achieve good outcome uh, blunt injuries and open injuries with a crushing element they have got a, a more uh, deeper impact than what we see compared to a penetrating open injuries when we see this uh, picture first picture we can see that the penetrating wound is there only in the proximal portion however the impact has gone quite far below which tells us that the tissues have absorbed uh, the uh, kinetic energy from the moving object and the whole limb is uh, whole skin is degloved uh, from the underlying tissues and this results in secondary loss of tissues so uh, the degloved skin it, whether it will survive or not we will come to know uh, only after few days of time so we need to uh, wait till we uh, till, uh, till we come to a clear idea whether the skin will survive or not and uh, better not to embark on immediate uh, soft tissue reconstructive procedures and in these kind of degloved skin region when we do free flaps there is a possibility that uh, the flaps can fail coming to the deep debridement here is a video i am going to show uh, in a open, small open wound and a large and open two separate videos i am showing this is a proximal tibia uh, segmental combination fracture with a small wound on the medial side uh, the limb is swollen and the wound is on the uh, lying on the anterolateral aspect of the wound of uh, the, the leg in the proximal third region the it, immediately after uh, draping we need to extend the skin proximally and pro uh, distally and then uh, complete removal of the Uh, skin edges which are necros should be rem uh, should be done and then once we extend proximally and distally uh, the deeper tissues needs to be excised uh, by using a scissor we uh, we need to uh, we need to bring out the uh, fragment which is uh, quite close to the skin bring out uh, outside and then debride it completely Uh, the medullary contamination sometimes can be quite deep inside than what we see in the x-ray so we, we need to bring out the projecting bone uh, outside and then completely curate it after debriding the uh, soft tissues the uh, deeper layers like fascia needs to be completely excised uh, leaving this fascia can result in uh, deep infection and uh, this is a uh, one more uh, video which shows a large wound with a comminuted uh, tibia fracture the, this is how the trolley is used a washing a washing trolley uh, to wash the leg before uh, we start the debridement here uh, the whole dirt on the leg apart from the open wound the dirt or the distal portion and proximal portion can be removed by using savlon solution and we can wash completely proximally and distally Uh, and in addition to that the stains can be removed by using uh, uh, additional hydrogen peroxide and the whole limb needs to be completely uh, shaved so that we know the it will have a, it will give a clear vision for the debridement and uh, the medullary canal most of the times the contaminants will be quite deeper so we need to use a curate and then completely curate it and the superficial layer one layer needs to be completely removed 
the fascia and tissues completely. However, the viable tissues, the viable muscle should not be uh, excised. We need to check the viability by holding the muscle with the forceps, which uh, tell, tells us by contracting. And the contractile uh, muscle can be assessed by looking at contractility and the color and consistency and capacity to bleed. And uh, we need to assess, we need to be careful in uh, removing the uh, viable tissue. And one need to remember that no flap can compensate poor debridement. It is the, uh, more than the time, timing of debridement, the technique of debridement uh, is very important to achieve good outcome in major open injuries like this. And this is a major open injury where the segmental combination is seen with the large cortical fragments lying. And these cortical fragments without any soft tissue attachment need to be removed. Uh, since leaving these kind of uh, bony fragments inside can result in uh, uh, frequent infections. And uh, this is an open injury of the joint. All open injuries around the joint need to be completely exposed. The proximally and distally we need to excise the skin and joint arthrotomy has to be performed. And uh, around the knee joint, we can flex the knee completely and check whether there are any uh, dirt or other particles. And in this x-ray, we can see that the glass particles are uh, lying underneath the patella. However, the wound appears to be quite small and superficial. So all the joints need to be completely uh, opened up, do the arthrotomy properly and then uh, remove the contaminants. Due to ne negative suction effects, sometimes the contaminants can be uh, thrown quite deep in inside the wound. And uh, the next question comes, uh, who does the debridement? Orthoplastic approach is very important. On day one, involvement of uh, experienced team of uh, both orthopedic, orthopedic and plastic surgery team is very important uh, to achieve a good outcome because the day one involvement of both plastic and orth orthopedic surgeons uh, with experience can uh, decide about the further plan and assess the viability of the tissues and the need for further reconstructive procedures on day one and the earlier soft tissue cover is possible and uh, plan will be decided quite easily and uh, in our institution we follow the same orthoplastic approach and we achieve uh, very good results with this approach. Uh, now uh, so far we have seen how to debride the wound and uh, the technique of debridement and now let us see how to stabilize the open injuries and how far to go on a day one. Uh, we need to remember that most of the open fractures they present often with poly in a polytrauma situation. Here comes the life first and uh, limb next. So first we need to look at the systemic injuries and we need to do as minimal as possible for these kind of open injuries and day one uh, damage control surgery is very important and external fixators are safe and simple uh, without any much uh, damage to the additional without causing any additional damage to the limb. So damage control procedures by external fixators are safe and simple and external fixators are uh, workhorses uh, for the, in treating the open injuries. The ex uh, external fixator is quite safe. It, is a st it provides good stability. It is a versatile swift method to, uh, to achieve good stability. And we, one need to remember that we should not apply the external fixator before we complete the debridement because once we apply the external fixator and then start doing the debridement, there is a possibility that we can leave the contaminants more deeper inside. So first we need to debride the wound properly and then stabilize the external fixator. And while applying the external fixator, we need to uh, apply, we need to follow the principles of Beherens and uh, apply the external fixator. And better to discuss with the plastic surgery team on day one, uh, which side needs to be the external fixator so that is it, it is easy to do soft tissue cover later. The principles of external fixator is we need to use uh, uh, pre, uh, we need to do pre-drilling pre to minimize thermal necrosis and pin should be placed through the intact soft tissues not through the open wound and uh, we need to avoid the injuries to the neurovascular structures. We need to be uh, vigilant about uh, placement of the neurovascular structures and we need to be quite uh, far away from the uh, neurovascular structure so that we don't uh, catch them while, while drilling or uh, while putting the external fixator pins. 
and we need to be quite far away from uh, capsular uh, reflections of the joints so that septic arthritis doesn't come and uh, infections chances can be avoided in, while, while drilling through the soft tissues we need to use drill sleeves so that the uh, soft tissues will not be caught while drilling the bone and uh, we need to apply the external fixator with the uh, two pins quite close to the uh, fracture site and two pins quite far away by spanning the complete bone uh, which helps to give uh, good stability and the skeletal fixation is planned day one after debridement and some, uh, if there is a bone loss we can uh, plan for uh, straight away orthofix or elizero which, uh, whichever system is comfortable so that the soft tissue cover can be uh, achieved quite early. Whenever we see open intraocular fractures in a, a major injuries, we can follow da uh, damage control surgery uh, uh, procedures by adopting two-step strategy. Uh, on day one, we can debride the uh, wound, open the joint completely, debride uh, adequately, we debride the wound, and we can do joint ocular uh, reconstruction, and then uh, we can span the joint and once the patient is stabilized completely, uh, two to three days later, we can do definitive fixation uh, once the patient is fit for next procedure. Uh, I would like to share one case where uh, a, a patient presents with a poly, in a polytrauma situation, both upper limb and lower limb injuries. No other injuries except uh, both upper limb and lower limb injuries. Patient was quite stable. This is an open uh, side swipe injury with a, a gross combination of the elbow and uh, distal femur and proximal tibia floating knee injury with two wounds in the leg with the uh, intermediate degloat skin and patient lactate uh, is five, five millimoles per liter and uh, he had a shock on arrival. The serum lactate is one of the important indicator whether uh, to go ahead for definitive procedures or we need to do resuscitation. Less than 2.5 millimoles uh, per liter is is a clear indicator that patient is re resuscitated adequately. In this patient on day one, how far we can go is in lower limb injury, it is always important that we stabilize it uh, with external fixator uh, so that the wounds can be debrided quickly and then external fixator can be applied. And upper limb injuries, uh, especially around the joints, it is better that on day one we reconstruct the joints uh, where the fragments are quite easily mobile and easy to reconstruct on day one so that the joints can be reconstructed like this uh, after debridement. Uh, joints can be reconstructed like this and uh, lower limb can be stabilized with external fixator. And this patient had ulnar nerve uh, uh, rupture which was repaired on day one itself. And after, after three days, once the lactate has been normalized, we proceeded with uh, uh, distal femur plating and then hybrid external fixator uh, for the proximal tibia since there is degloved skin uh, with the two open large open wounds and this patient required multiple soft tissue procedures for, for complete healing of the soft tissue defect of the proximal tibia and uh, he achieved a complete union of all the fractures and a good recovery of the ulnar nerve also. So, and here is one more patient uh, who presents with upper limb uh, severe crush injury as well as open pelvic book, uh, injury uh, in a short situa situation. And in these situations where there is a, a open injury of both the pelvis and then uh, forearm, it, uh, it is better that we stabilize and resuscitate the patient uh, adequately and then uh, stabilize the pelvis by doing damage control procedure and upper limb can be quickly plated. Plating is better in upper limb injuries and uh, in lower limb injuries and pelvic injuries, the external fixator is quite uh, easy and quick procedure to uh, save the patient by doing damage control procedures. And this patient had a uh, complete union and good, he achieved good result as well. So, so to conclude, orthoplastic team approach is very important to achieve good results in open injuries. The six hour rule of debridement is no longer valid. It is the adequacy of the debridement that is more important than the timing of debridement. However, the debridement has to be done as early as possible uh, according to the patient general condition and then uh, resuscitation is very important. Damage control procedures are very important to save the patient and then to achieve good results. Uh, bone stability and early soft tissue cover are uh, important steps to achieve good uh, outcome in the open injuries. Thank you.
Thank you, Devendra. So it is an excellent talk that you gave, and I am pretty sure that you now a lot of our postgraduates would have definitely understood how far to go on day one. So we have made it very clear. Thank and you. We will go on to the next. Uh, that will be by me. So after uh, going through the discussion on like moment there is a open fracture and then the way we take them to theater as an emergency emergency maneuver and then from there you are also assessing the patient and then you decide to go ahead and say debride the patient and then score the patient and then also you decide to do what are the things that you have to do on day one and moment you do that we also need to look at the clinical situation of those patients and also look at the reconstruction possibilities for these open injuries the topic that has been chosen is complex clinical situation and reconstruction but how do we know what is complex actually the by definition if you want to look at and see what is the complex clinical situation in a open scenario open fracture scenario it is the ganga hospital score that will let you know whether it is a complex or not because you see it is the scoring that also and also like it will tell you the complexity involved in all of these each of the parameters that are involved so like you are scoring the each component of the injury and that will let you know how complicated it is and anything that is a loss that is a composite tissue loss is there whether it is a skin loss or a bone loss that will make it even more complex so this ganga hospital open injury severity score i i'm also want to summarize what has been taught now to you is that a skin score of more than 3 always requires a flap bone score of 4 and 5 requires complex reconstruction like transport and vascularized free fibula score of 9 or less indicated as a low violence trauma and early reconstruction can be done that's what dr devendra also has told you and also professor rashekrini is uh, score told you that score of nine or less you it can be considered as a, a low violence and then it can be managed as a day one uh, trauma day one reconstructions whereas those above it like 10 and above they need to have a staged reconstruction this is what you learnt in now the open injury uh, severe uh, scoring and if you look at this patient who has got a skin score of 2 that means there is no skin loss but over the fracture site muscle you see just it is a exposed muscle you can see through one of the corner of the wound and then bone it is like there is a wedge combination and then you take it as two and there are no comorbidities involved in this patient he is a young man and his total score is only 5 you all know that by now that this can be managed as a day one reconstruction but once you know that this can be managed as a day one and also you need to know how much to go on day one and for that you need to know that if the patient's general condition and the lo local wound condition permit to go ahead to fix do the definitive fixation and cover if possible both can be done if the general condition and wound condition is good enough both of them can be done if not staged reconstruction is advisable but always you must remember that anesthetist guidance is very very important they play a very important role in guidance because of the system involved and also they will be let you know that how far the patients can be treated with that anesthesia on that day 
and if the patient is unlikely to return to ot soon for example if they if you give anesthesia and if the patient has got a head injury and then if you think that and then the patient on the same day also you had to put a chest tube and these patients generally may take some time but on the day one anesthesia if patient is tolerating well better to finish lot of procedure that can be done for these patients so remember this if the local condition and general condition is good enough and if there is anesthetist tells you that you can go ahead to do it and in a situation where you are unlikely to return to ot immediately in a few days time then it is better to do it majority of the things on day one and if you look at all these open injuries you know that they because it is a high velocity injury as well there may be like it can be associated with other injuries but also like you have to look at the comorbidities in the patients suppose if it is an extreme age group if the general health status is not good enough mental health is very important and also social factors like smoking and alcohol taken in in along with the local tissue that is there with the biochemical markers that is the lactate levels that are there you can decide on the staging so these also may play very important role in staging these complex fractures let us look at this you can see here the total score has come to 8 in this patient that is still it is like less than 9 and you can go ahead to do all of them into a quick procedure like that's why within 48 hours even the flap has been done it's a vascular that is a free muscle flap has been done here and that also has been done within 48 hours that is within the primary healing phase so these are the things that you can look so primary nailing can be done on day 1 and within 2 days you can go ahead to do a major flap as well so this is all possible when it is less than 9 and this is the patient at 9 for 5 months and then it goes on to heal well and once you decide like how far to go on day 1 the next time next is you have to look at timing of later reconstruction how do we decide on the reconstruction possibilities that comes up in the later time that is on day 1 you have done but there are many things that you have to do later and this is exactly like what you all look at in a polytrauma open injury is also you have to look at it as a polytrauma because open injury is also involves your skeleton as well as another organ the skin both of them are involved and if there is an abbreviated injury score is more than 3 in either of them still it is a complex clinical situation and this is also it is also forms like a polytrauma and you have to look at it polytrauma you all know that it is a disease of hemorrhage and that is why you are looking at the vitals and then the coagulation and then you have to look at like an oxygenation levels and you have to always look at a normal lactate levels if there is an if if the lactate levels are very high you know that there is occult hyperperfusion in the tissues and then it it is requiring for recess you have to resuscitate them well to come to make sure it is get normalized then only you have to take them up for surgery the falling crp levels interleukin 6 levels and procalcitonin is one of the factor that you may have to take in between like it may indicate to you some amount of infection as well so you have to look at all those and platelets must be more than a lakh and then urine output must be 1 to 2 ml per kg per hour if these are all good if you can make sure that these are all good then it gives you a window of opportunity for you to go ahead and do a next procedure and that is where you have to think of a definitive fixation till that time you have to manage them in ic these patients must be managed till the, all these parameters come to normalcy and then take up, take them up for definitive fixation as i said these open injuries if they have bled a lot then it becomes like a disease of hemorrhage and then you have to manage all all of them related to that so let us look at this patient who has on arrival was conscious irritable bp was just 40 by 37 mm of mercury pulse is like 140 per minute and then uh, spo2 is 88% the extremities were cold peripheral pulse not palpable and carotid pulse only is palpable 
See, he has got all these fractures. He has got a, a femoral neck fracture, and then he has got open fracture involving the distal femur, and then he has got a tibia fracture as well, and then he also has got an abdominal injury in addition to an upper limb injury. So that means it was a major injury as such. The systems are involved, the organs are involved, and also the he has bled a lot. In addition, he has got uh, head injury because of the loss of consciousness and all of them put together in a 18 year old male where only the carotid it is an emergency you have to immediately shift them to the theater you have to make sure what's happening you have to get your intensivist and the anesthetist to come along with you and then in our hospital it is the anesthetist who receives the patient and then they make sure that they he gets stabilized Meanwhile, you need to look at and then do the uh, survey and make sure all the injuries are analyzed. And then in this patient, what happened was, moment we took them in and then we put a tourniquet. Once the tourniquet was applied and uh, his blood pressure was getting stabilized. So then we knew that the bleeding can be more in the, in the thigh rather than in the abdomen. But however, it is very difficult to say where exactly it's at. So we were waiting for some time and then we, we could see that it was getting stabilized once the tourniquet was put in. And once the tourniquet was put in, once the research station was done, the, always you have to make sure the central line is put in and then the crystalloids are rushed in. So it is the ringer lactate you have to give. And also like you have to make sure that it is the packed cells as well as the fresh frozen plasma everything has to be there you can you can give it is one is to one is to one ratio and then if it is given and then once the patient's blood pressure everything gets stabilized it is good but here after giving flu, uh, fluid as well as blood and then the fresh frozen plasma here he had a two units of a packed cells and two units of fresh frozen plasma and the two liters of ringer lactate his pulse pressure uh, blood pressure came to 100 by 70. so at this stage we had to decide what take what is the best way to go forward so we cannot say that it is a open injury that requires debridement we have to think on all those lines but we definitely knew that once we put in our tourniquet he was getting stabilized so the whole idea was to make sure that Where exactly is the cause for bleeding? So whether it is an active bleed in the abdomen or is it the vascular injury in the right lower limb? This quick decision we had to make. And when we took, checked the abdomen, there was no increase in the girth. There was nothing was happening. The abdomen remained soft. So immediately we felt that it is only like uh, we can take them for CT scan quickly. And then we took a CT scan at this stage. And then we found out there was a hemothorax, there was a hemoperitoneum and of course along with the other, other uh, fractures that we could identify, the lactate level was 15.9 that means there was a lot of uh, hypotension was there and then 15.9 is extremely high and we, have, we made a diagnosis of what's happening, it was a vascular injury in the distal femur and then immediately we took them up for and then uh, we made a decision to amputate the limb. See, like these are the situations where you have to look at. If you, in this scenario, if you take the open injury score as uh, part of it, the open injury score would be less. Whereas the clinical situation demands that it has to be done urgently and to save the life, we had to amputate. So once we did this, patient became all right. And once later on, the definitive fixations were carried out of all these fractures, remaining fractures, and then it was salvaged. The patient went home happily later because we could save the uh, life of the patient. And then in these situations, again, if the complexity involves like if there is a vital organs are involved, when there is an open injury with vital organs are involved, they go hand in hand. So they don't, they are not separate. So you have to make sure that ICD has to be done means you have to put an ICD, you have to make sure that you have to interpret them quickly and then survey all these vascular lines 
central lines, everything has to be performed. And then if there is a lung contusion or hemopericardium, so they can also come with all these uh, problems. You have to make sure that you are. So what essentially I want to tell is, the open fracture is uh, teamwork. You have to get a right team involved. From the beginning, you have to get anesthetist involved. You have to get internist involved. You have to have your plastic surgeons involved because the moment they see in the beginning itself, they will do the debridement part of it. And we have a setup where everything is done here. So it is like anesthetist receives, plastic surgeons debride, and we go and fix as an orthopedic surgeon. This is a fantastic combination that you can get. And you see here with hemoperitoneum patient, we, have, we are able to completely tap it and then he becomes all right at later. Mm -hmm. So this is a scenario where he comes with an injury and also like he has got a chest injury, like a stab injury to the chest. And then if this patient also has to be uh, uh, revived, so all these will go on hand in hand. And once they are made all right, you are, you, 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 meanwhile, as as an abdominal is being taken care of, as the chest is being taken care of, one team can work on those areas and then the lower limbs you can work separately as uh, separately there and then get it going quickly so that the anesthesia time can be reduced. So abdominal injury can also be managed in the same time in addition to all these uh, injuries. Supposing if there is a pelvic injury along with a open injury and then you have to also manage a urinary bladder injury, all this will go together. So once these are managed, the definitive fixations can be done as I said in a window of opportunity time where all the parameters come to your uh, normalcy. So teamwork and quick clinical decision making is the most important thing. So if you ever have to make a quick clinical decision, multiple people must get involved and then only you will be doing it right and also staging will come correctly. So now look at this. This is how we all get into a uh, situation and you can see that this is a common problem that a lot of you would get it. He has got a major injury like this. You can see that you know, there is large area of skin is involved and also like there is yeah, two wounds are there. One is a large area here and there is a, one more wound here. So intervening skin bridge also shows bruising. So as Dr. Devendra has pointed out to you, like when there are two wounds with the intervening skin bridge, you have to note that the skin bridge also will be a degloved skin. So this point has to be always remembered. And once you notice that, you have to make sure that these two wounds are made to the skin like you have to cut across the skin and then make sure that you debride it and then this patient also had a bone loss and if you once it is made all right then you can have to have a reconstruction so it is not a simple reconstruction see like this entire wound we have to uh, skin graft reduce the area where you have to get your uh, soft tissue into a flap and he has got a cross leg flap and then within this area of a skin that is where the skin graft zone we have to make a corticotomy and then slowly transfer it and then once it is transferred you have a skin that is not a great skin where you have to cut across and put a bone graft as well. So it is a complex scenario and in this you have to make a correct decision and the, all the skin incisions that you make must be an appropriate skin incision. So in those instances it is always the help of plastic surgeons will help for you, will be of great use to you. And then once that is done, this patient will end up with a good outcome and he has completely become normal and he carries on with his normal day-to-day -day activities. So this is a 24-year-old male. So you can see that at similar, he has, he, come, he has come to us after two days of injury. And then he had an initial fixation and then this almost similar, like it is a symmetrical in injury that you get and he has got a fixation that was done. And what is to be seen is like we have to debride them again. And this patient was sent to us with intubation and we took them up as he was intubated as well with the vitals were all normal. We took them up for re debriding because always when the patient comes to you like this, you have to have a relook. You have to see the wound, completely examine it under anesthesia 
and then if there is any change that you have to make you can make it on that day itself so we know that we it has been sent and then we debrided it where and then once we debrided it we have to make sure that this external fixate also has to be changed so on on examination what was what it ended up with the bone loss and we had to convert it into an lrs frame and then it is a symmetrical exactly the same on both sides and then the same fixation on either side of them was done and then the transport was done and once the transport is done on both sides and then the docking was completed as the docking was completed it went on to heal well and you can see that the patient walking with both the frame on either side and then he has completely healed and then you can see that he has gone back to his normal activities so this is this is how uh, all the complex injuries are managed but the key to this is the teamwork that plays into its play and also like the initial debridement we need to remember that in all open injuries what are we worried about it is the non union and the infection the infection is like if you have debrided it extremely well majority of the times it will heal well the non union is something like you have to make sure that there is no instability in any type of your treatment instability is the beginning of the end if you think that there is any fixation that you do some something is unstable then it will end up with failure so make sure that the stability that you give in a fracture situation is perfect and if you have debrided extremely well and take it to stages go through what has been there and then make sure that you have gone into the stages exactly at appropriate time then it will go into a good healing so once you know that these are the parameters that you need to look at and then you have to take it into account you need to know that what are the team play that has impact in each of the situations there are scenarios where you have to look at in an orthopedic challenge as well so here is a lady who came to us she is a very young lady but uh, on in the accident she lost her husband so it was a high velocity injury and then she comes to us with a injury like this she has got a multi uh, uh, injury over the knee and then the distal aspect of the thigh as well as the distal aspect of the leg with in this instance but she also had loss of consciousness head injury was present and then initially she was treated elsewhere and then she comes to us foot injury so you can see that there is a, a bone loss at the distal femur and then the distal tibia fracture with the, uh, all these so what we have to do at this stage is like as devendra pointed out that is on day 1 depending upon the general condition and then like this is the score will be very high in these instances so we have to wait so you do a external fixator on day 1 moment we do it on day 1 patient is still intubated so on the next day if the vitals are stable what we did was when the vitals were stable because the patient was intubated so and then the young lady and the, see like the orthopedic challenge is that the distal femur is a very tiny segment it's a very tiny segment with a bone loss in these instances if you allow the patient to be on a trans fixation for very long time and by any chance if she develops a ardia scenario or anything like that at later stage your fixations are going to be very much delayed in these instances you will end up with having a poor result and also like because it was debrided one day prior next day the wound also you can have a relook of the debridement and then once the relook is done you can also convert it into definitive fixation as the patient is intubated when the vitals are stable and all the other parameters are normal like lactate has come back to normalcy platelet count is uh, more than a lakh and the urinary output is good enough so you have to make sure that you have to decide on this like let us not wait till the it is extubated not like you have because it is intubated is another opportunity for you to go take them and then do it so what we did was like take them next day itself and then go ahead look at analyze the bone loss it was nearly around 10 cm of bone loss then we had to take an allograft and then we used bone grafts as well auto and allograft and then finish the fixation for the uh, distal femur 
and once the distal femur fixation was done and then later on the flap was done for the lower limb or that is the tibia lower end of tibia and then at three months time you can see that the distal femur fixation was there and then we have started bending the knee joint for this patient and only left is like we have to do the distal tibia bone grafting and uh, fixation definitive fixation at this stage so this is how you can also shorten the times and then most important is we have got back the knee movements so many of the patients like when there is an extensive open injury uh, patients you may lose lot of these knee movements they can end up with having uh, uh, other is other problems of uh, soft tissue stiffness so you have to circumvent this so earlier you do and then start moving the knee joint lot of advantages take place and also mobilization also brings you up brings across it will prevent dvt problems all those things are there so you have to be very careful and then stage it and then quickly you can go ahead to do all this uh, like so like also like this is another complex situation where you can see there is a distal femur fractures and then with the open for see like lot of them will have a small wound but the bone will get ejected out and then you will end up with the bone loss and then in this again you can see like again an allograft can be used i just want as a continuation of the previous one you can see that the allograft has been used and it has been like they get into a four month scenario and at around 14 months it has completely got incorporated allograft takes longer time to get incorporated and then you see can he gets a very good movement and function so these are the methods by which you can also get a good outcome and this is what is very important when there is a critical salvage like a patient has got an upper limb as well as lower limb and then both of them are extremely critical and then upper limb the muscles were already in rigor mortis so we had to amputate the upper limb so in this patient if the lower limb also is a problem he can't have a prosthesis to be put on and he will always require persons to help them so best is to save the lower limb in this patient and then you can see that we had to after amputation this lower limb salvage we had to do you can see the massive uh, uh, tibia defect and with this massive tibia defect we can see that the lower third we have put only elisero ring with a frame and then slowly started distracting from lower a bifocal corticotomy was done to shorten the time and then as it came off and then it went on to heal and then like uh he goes on to have a good function at later date so this again a fracture that initially external fixator and then like you can see that all these bone fragments are necros we had to do a flap and then it has a transport and then again it goes on to heal see these are all very major complex situations and then like the lower limb defect when there is a unlike the transport that previously i showed if there is a big defect also you can also do a vascularized fibula in a vascularized fibula if you do you have to do a plating and then once the the skin paddle also will come along with the vascularized fibula and you can use that as a one of the method to get it and here again it will go on to well one of the thing that Uh, though in tibia we use a vascularized fibula in a, in a distal femur the capana technique is one of the technique that can be used with where the fibula as well as the allograft can be mixed allograft will give you a structural uh, graft and then the fibula will give you the uh, blood supply to it and then we long segment bone loss can be managed in these fashions and then you can see that it it can go on to heal well so all these are complex scenarios but if it is well managed then it will be giving you a very good result so what i would like to say is that open fracture by themselves are a major challenge but when it can become more complicated when there is a composite tissue loss like a bone loss and the skin loss so we have to involve a team and then like because they are high velocity injuries they can also involve other systems as well so if you involve everybody as a team from the day one you can achieve a very good result in the end so it is a long road for this open injuries management but the end of it it will be very beautiful but what you need is a good infrastructure a teamwork and that will be the best way you can achieve this great great success thank you so now we have there is also a feedback form given to you so if you all take some time and then write the feedback 
uh, write give us the feedback form it will be uh, great so we'll take 3 minutes time and then please uh, for those of you who are participating please send us the feedback form so shivani you uh, you you are sending it Uh, so tech support from here. I'm sending feedback. Yeah, please send the feedback form so they can fill it up. So once that is done, probably will take two minutes off, and then we'll have a, uh, a discussions. There, I see the lot of questions have come, so we'll take the questions. So I request Devendra to unmute as well as meanwhile. Sir. Devendra? Yes, sir. So the two minutes time is there. So meanwhile, you can take few questions. So can you ask? Uh, Sabapati to be here. So we'll take some questions now. So one of the question is like Jairam from Kerala has asked role of antibiotics and choice of antibiotics in open fracture. Ramesh, you can answer this question. Yes, sir. The antibiotics are uh, mostly it is a therapeutic, so it has to be uh, given. The recommended is uh, early systemic administration of uh, administration of antibiotics is recommended. So once the patient has uh, come to the emergency room, probably you can ask for the medical problems whether the patient is having any chronic kidney disease or any other uh, allergic problems. The patients might have an allergic to penicillin or patient might having uh, probably a chronic uh, renal problems. So you can take the blood test. when the patient is undergoing the resuscitation and process by the time uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, you get the uh, reports so mostly you can look for the renal profile if it is okay means you can uh, give a second generation cephalosporins we used to give uh, cefiroxim uh, 1.5 mg so iv we gave it uh, we gave, gave a test dose and then we gave a standard uh, iv infusion in the emergency room itself in grade 1 and 2 injuries if the injuries is become more grade 3 then just we add amikacin injection so we used to give 1 gram iv od injections if there is a formaldehyde or contamination we add uh, metronidazole and we used to give a tetanus toxoid for all patients who are coming to our casualty so these are things we give it in the casualty that will be done for the at least for 48 to 72 hours So when the debridement is done and the wound is primarily closed, that is the grade one and two. There is we give it the antibiotic for two days time. If the patient needs further uh, soft tissue cover, from the time of soft tissue cover, we repeat the dose of cefiroxim amikacin for further two to three days time. A total of a three B injuries will get a duration of five to six days time. This is our uh, protocol. When there is a problem of uh, wound infection in the the later period, we take the culture, we do the debridement. according to the culture sensitivity we give we further we modify the iv antibiotics that is our protocol okay thank you so devendra yes sir sandeep vyas from maharashtra has asked so when should we do amputation for open 3b fractures and when should we consider amputation for a open 3b fracture so he has asked when do you definitely amputate when do you consider amputation in 3b fractures sir 
uh, to decide about the amputation as salvage our uh, ganga hospital open injury severity score helps uh, after debridement when we score the open injury and if the score is 17 a uh, total score is 17 or above it is a clear indication that a uh, patient will have a very difficult reconstructive uh, procedures and it needs to be amputated surely so total score of 17 and above needs clear cut amputation and 14 and below are uh, clearly uh, easily we can salvage the limbs and 15 and 16 are gray zones where uh, we need to decide whether to do amputation or uh, salvage based on multiple other factors like uh, patient general condition, age, other comorbid factors and the skill of the surgical team, the experience, multiple factors needs to be considered before we take up for a decision and if we think that we are, uh, your setup doesn't uh, allow to salvage those kind of limbs, uh, better to refer to a center where uh, they can be treated uh, easily and uh, in a, uh, when, when to consider an amputation is uh, in a polytrauma situation where a patient is quite unstable and to save the life of a limb, a life of a patient, sometimes we may decide on table to take up the limb so that the bleeding gets get controlled. Those are the, uh, that is the only one indication uh, where we consider amputation uh, in a polytrauma situation and to guide whether to amputate or salvage the limb, uh, Ganga Hospital Open Injury Score, total score will help us. Thank you. So, Vinil, Ch Vinil Choudhury from Chennai has asked, Sir, definitive surgery in open articular injuries on day one presentation, when can we do them, sir? So, see, like when, when they, whenever there is a open articular injuries, and when they present, actually all the articular injuries on day one itself, you must definitely fix it. Because if you go ahead and start, try to sort them out later on, uh, if there is some amount of, you, it is very difficult to correct them. You, can, you may not get a right articular concrete. On day one, everything will be scattered and then you will be able to match them well. So it is better to do it on day one itself. So the, there is no doubt about it, all articular fractures has to be managed on day one. Shantanu Kar from Delhi has asked how to manage bone loss in acute settings if definitive fixation is planned. So like one of the cases that I presented also like the where it was a bilateral injury, immediately after the debridement, so we have put a limb reconstruction system as a definitive fixation because it is when you put it, there is also like because the area is open, what we do also there is something called, we can use the intramedullary rod as well as a side plate to get it reduced so that the bones are in good reduction. That means it good alignment. Then you stabilize your LRS frame. Then it will be easier on day one itself because you get the alignment. And once the definitive fixation is done, then a flap can be done. See, like you discuss with the plastic surgeons where exactly you want the flap. Mm -hmm. Suppose if they say that it is a cross leg flap, you cannot have a fixation on the medial side. So you have to, it has to be on the lateral side. So you have to discuss with them and then put a flap. They will, they will be planning for the flap. So day one, bone loss if you get, it is easier to manage. You get a good alignment and then get it managed. Suppose if there is a fragment which, uh, which needs to be removed, you retain the fragment, debride the fragment, retain the fragment, reduce it well and then secure your LRS and then remove the top so that you get the bone gap in good alignment. So all these are possibilities. Once the cover is done, then you can go on to have a uh, uh, procedures done. So M. Vijay Kumar from Andhra Pradesh has asked, the role of procalcitonin levels in compound fracture situations. So procalcitonin is generally is an indicator of infection. So it is like whenever there is sudden increase of procalcitonin level, it is uh, and also a lot of the times patients are like they are also part of a polytrauma. And suppose if they are all developing an ARDS or there is a delay in your next definitive fixation, one of the way you have to find out when any sepsis is there is by uh, testing the pro, uh, asking for the procalcitonin levels. 
so there is high um, high there is a la, increased uh, uh, like abnormal levels of uh, procalcitonin levels are all indicative of uh, uh, infection so we definitely do it when the patient were when the timing for next stage is getting delayed so we have to check them out so shridhar from telangana has uh, asked kindly elaborate post op rehabilitation protocol after open injuries x fix for 6 weeks and brace and then internal fixation so she says like how do you do rehabilitation suppose if there is a open injury in external fixation devendra you want to take it yes sir once the wound uh, wound heals with external fixator itself we can mobilize the patient uh, initially by non weight bearing and after 6 weeks time uh, we can make them weight bear also with uh, if the external fixator is quite stable and adequately placed pins without any pin track infection Uh, we can mobilize it, mobilize the patient by weight bearing by the end of 6 weeks and after 3 months time uh, we can remove the external fixator and put him on a uh, functional bracing which will help to walk uh, with full weight bearing initially with the elbow crutch patient can be made to walk and uh, after 4 months time 4 and 1/2 months time he can be independent so he also <laughs> Yeah, he also asked whether reamed versus unreamed nailing in 3 AB open tibia fractures. So now the consensus is that there is uh, all the open fractures you can go and do a reamed nailing only. Earlier they were thinking that unreamed nail is better because the endosteal blood supply is retained. But however, the Rhinelander study and all said that within three weeks the endosteal blood supply comes back. So I think. there is no question now that controversy is not there now the reamed nailing is uh, is a better option and jawahar from salem has asked how long you give oral antibiotics at the time of discharge ramesh yes sir uh, we don't give any oral antibiotics at the time of discharge so we used to give an iv antibiotic for duration of 3 uh, to 5 days depending upon the uh, grade of injury and the one the wound is uh, healing well and we usually discharge the patient only with a uh, uh, painkillers if they have more pain they will take with some multivitamins we don't give any oral antibiotics if the wound is uh, doubtful we take a culture and then we go for a debridement we don't give any oral antibiotic if the wound is uh, healing well so i'm thinking from maharashtra as one of the case one had a primary im nailing of open tibia fracture could you please elaborate on nails versus x fix in such cases see like the im nailing is like if you know that the velocity is low that is like the open injury score is less than 9 and also wound is clean so it is there is not contaminated so you can definitely go ahead and do a uh op na primary nailing in those instances where you think that injury is local condition is not good the contamination was very severe you will not be able to manage them very quickly so that is, that is like within 48 hours you may not be able to cover in those scenarios only you have to look at an external fixation as an option but external fixation is also an option when there is a high velocity injury and then there is a poly, other systems are also involved then you will have to look at as a external fixator but in an isolated injury where the low velocity less than score 9 is always preferable to go ahead and do as construction that is why im nailing is preferable in those instances shrinivas uh, from naiveli has asked so considering a case of 3b tibial plateau fracture with big or multiple medium small fracture is putting multiple k wires onto the fragment during x fix is suggested any advice on the situation no bone loss so if it is a 3b tibial plateau fractures so we don't have to go ahead and do all the plate fixations on all the sides it is try to do articular reconstruction and then do the basic like hybrid fixation you do and then come out to and then 
make it like a, a damage control type of surgery. Once the soft tissue, everything is covered, you can think of yeah, definitely fixations. Jawar also asked role of VAC indications of high grade open tibial fractures. Devendra, you can take this VAC. Yes, Actually, after the debridement, uh, there is no role for VAC in regular open injury management unless uh, if the open if the soft tissue cover is getting delayed due to some reasons like patient is uh, quite unstable and needs to be intubated and uh, kept for observation uh, in a polytrauma situation where the duration for next procedure uh, is quite long in in those situations to buy the time we can use a vac so that uh, bone and uh, tissues doesn't get dried up and desiccated so otherwise early soft tissue cover is uh, indicated rather than choosing for uh, vac so we in our institution we don't use vac regularly only in uh, certain situations like in polytrauma patients where uh, we are not able to cover the patient uh, for soft tissue cover not able to take up immediately in those situations only we use vac otherwise there is no role of vac in primary management of open injuries. Puneet, Puneet Kumar from Hassan has asked, post-operative limb viability of crush injuries assessment. So if it is a post-operative case after probably what he means is post-surgery if there is a vascular injury or limb viability questions, how will you assess it? Uh, Limb viability can be assessed by looking at the pulse by using a, a, a small a, a small flow Doppler study by handheld Doppler or we can do CT angio if the uh, urea creatinine is normal and uh, if there is a, uh, we can look at the urine color uh, where uh, myoglobin area is uh, seen or not we can check the urine color as well. And then uh, renal parameters is one of the important indicator uh, whether there is any muscle crush, uh, severe crush is seen. The uh, viability of the limb can be assessed by doing either handheld Doppler or CT angiogram. Post surgery, if there is any doubt, we can do CT angiogram. In addition, also remember that open injuries, you must not forget a compartment syndrome. Like even in open injuries, you can have a compartment syndrome. So that also is a contributory factor that you need to remember. And also like if there is a scenario in this, if the renal parameters are all good, you can also do a CT angiogram. So then only you can assess all these, you can get it done. So I think now we have answered many of the questions that are there. Nearly we have done it and uh, it is time. So, so hope uh, our students benefited out of our webinar and all the points we have covered nicely for the open injuries. And Shivani, you are a look. I think we yes, will. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Session. So, essentially, like I also would like to thank Ortho TV Ashok Sham. And then Neeraj is also there, Ashok? No, Neeraj is not there. Yeah, I am here. Ashok, it has been wonderful. Uh -huh. Like, you now I am a fan of Ortho TV. You now I am seeing a lot of. Uh, uh, webinars in Arthur TV and also in my leisure time also I am seeing a lot of uh, webinars. Thank you very much sir. You have uploaded it so it is it is really wonderful that now I don't have to look different aspects at all. I don't have to look on other journals also. Everything hey. Great, great job. So thanks, thanks a lot sir. Thank you all so, for being with us today. So,